baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. We'll all stand. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And we just want to pray that God's will would be done in this service in a mighty and a powerful way. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we worship you. We give you the thanks and the glory and all the honor for all the beautiful things that you've done in the last few services, Father, the miracles that have taken place, the prayers that you've already answered. Father, we give you the thanks, the glory, and the honor. We give you all the worship, Father. We ask that you bless this evening tonight. We pray that you would loose angels into this building, that there would be liberty in this building for everybody that has a need to be, to be met, Father. If there's anybody that needs a healing in this body tonight, that they would be healed by the power of God in the beautiful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Have your way, Father, in each and every one of their lives. We ask that you grant the Campatella a safe passage home, that you loose your angels along the highways and the byways, that you would protect them in all their travels in the beautiful name of Jesus. And we ask that you bless this service. Our ushers will come forward. We'll take up our midweek tithe and offering. Lord, bless those who give in Jesus' name.
Give him that praise right now. God, we surrender to you. We surrender to your presence. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, yes. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flow.
of you agree with that. No one greater than our God. No one greater than our God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Turn to three or four people. Let them know that they came to the right place tonight. God bless you. Remain standing, if you would, a moment longer. We're going to bring Brother Campatella to the pulpit to bring the Word of God to us. Before we do, I just want to let you know that uh, when I scheduled Brother Campatella, I scheduled him twice for this year. He'll be back with us September 17th through the 20th. Amen. Isn't that great? And I want to say how much I've enjoyed not only his ministry, it's been a blessing to me personally as a man who loves God, and he's helped me in my relationship with God, but I've enjoyed our time together, just talking shop and sharing in our love for God and ministry. They have such a beautiful family, brother and sister Campatella, and uh, I feel like I've made a, a great friend. So thank you for... Uh, being sensitive to the Spirit and leading us closer to God. I also want to say how much we appreciate Sister Campatella. Please just raise your hand over there, Sister Campatella. Thank you for exhorting and encouraging us in the Word of God. She is a powerful vessel of God in her own right, and uh, they're just a wonderful example of what it means to be an evangelist. Amen. Also want to let you know that ATC gave them a cheese basket today. They're going home loaded with all their favorite cheeses. <laughs> and we'll look forward to them being back with us again. But we're going to hear from God tonight. If you're ready to receive something from the Lord, one more time, clap your hands as Brother Capitella comes. Thank you, Pastor Soto. Let's praise the Lord together. Would you lift your voice to the Lord and thank him for his presence in this house. We bless your name, Lord Jesus. We acknowledge your presence in this place. Hallelujah. If you've got the Holy Ghost, would you speak in tongues? Would you pray in tongues? Would you pray in the Spirit right now? Shina Mahata no Moko Yanda da Bahasa da da Bohotaya. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Praise the living God. What a marvelous presence of the Lord that is in this place tonight. I'm so thankful for what we have felt here, for what we have experienced here. And evangelism, being an evangelist, is kind of a weird animal. You go places and you leave, you make connections, and then you go on to the next place. In some places you go, you're very happy to leave. Other places you go, you're very sad to leave. And my wife and I are very sad to leave tomorrow. Thank you. Somebody said all. Oh, thank you for that right there. God bless you. But um, what, a, what an awesome, awesome time we have had. God has really blessed this church with Pastor and Sister Soto. My Lord have mercy. This couple, I have had an interesting phenomenon happen to me while I have been here, and I don't know if I've ever had it happen. But when I am with Brother and Sister Soda, when I'm talking to them, and when I'm around them, I can feel the love of God for them. And I feel like they are like Daniel in the Old Testament. This is a couple that is greatly beloved of God. And everything they do is blessed of God. And I was thinking of how to put into words what we have felt about this church 
and how you have responded to the Spirit and flowed in the Holy Ghost. And a lot of churches, there's a lot of big churches, there's a lot of great pastors and great congregations, but there is a unique, distinctive attribute that this church has in that it feels like the pastor and the people are one. There's no, there's no disconnect. There's just, it's one body moving. And all the food we have loved dearly. That was Holy Ghost led. I got some fried chicken today at some kind of barn. I forget what it was called. Machine shed. Have y'all been there? Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. That sacrificial bird gave his life for me, I'm telling you. And then the, the box of cheese and all the goodies. I mean, these are some of the most thoughtful people you've ever seen in your life. And we, we thank God for you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. I want to preach to you tonight what has been considered by some as a controversial message. But it is scripture nonetheless. And it is a powerful revelation of revival and spiritual dominion. I want to turn your attention to Exodus chapter 25, beginning with verse 18. Thank you to the music and the anointing that they bring. They're not up here just singing. They're ushering in the presence of the Lord. I thank God for them. Exodus 25 and 18. God is commanding Moses, and thou shalt make two cherubims, or angels, of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering. Everybody say covering covering the mercy seat with their wings and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be isaiah chapter 6 beginning with verse number one isaiah the prophet said in the year that king uzziah died i saw also the lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up and his train or glorious garment filled the temple above it stood the seraphims everybody say angels this is a different type of angel each one had six wings with twain or with two he covered everybody say covered his face and with twain he covered everybody say covered covered his feet and with twain he did fly Final passages of Scripture while you're standing. 1 Corinthians 11 and 5. The Apostle Paul <clears throat> says, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth, which can mean preaching, with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Everybody say covered. Verse 14, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering everybody say covering but if any man seem to be contentious we have no such custom neither the churches of god i want to preach to you on this topic for a few minutes this evening the keepers of the glory the keepers of the glory would you put your bibles down let's lift our hands to the lord let's ask him to do what he wants to do if you can turn me up in this monitor right here that would be awesome father we love you tonight we thank you for your spirit I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would loose revelation, understanding in this house, open every eye to see, 
Open every ear to hear what thus saith the Lord. I bind every spirit that is contrary to the work of God in this city, in this church, in this region. I loose the mighty angels of God to work on behalf of your word and your people. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands one more time and let's give God some praise with our lips. Somebody shout hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus, you're wonderful, you're powerful, you're mighty. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Praise God. Give two or three people a high five as you're seated and say, let's have some church on Wednesday night. The Bible makes it very clear to us that Satan has a very special hatred for the woman. And it is not equal in his hatred for the man. Satan in particular is after the body of the woman. The woman is the regulator of morality in any culture. When you look in the scripture, the Bible tells us that there is a great whore sitting on the many waters. She has corrupted the nations. It does not say there is a great pimp sitting on the many waters corrupting the nation. It is a woman that is doing this. You can see that women are being used in the fashion industry, in many industries to promote products and advertising. Um, as a man, if I go grocery shopping and I go through the line, we have Publix in Florida. If I go through the line of Publix, I have to keep my eyes down because on my left side and on my right side, there is magazine after magazine of scantily clad women. And it has a tremendous effect on the atmosphere. What the woman does with her body affects the entire atmosphere. Men do not have that kind of power. They don't put men with their hairy legs showing on the cover of those magazines. It just doesn't have the same effect. But the woman is being used to promote immorality in culture. Now, Paul teaches us in Corinthians 11 that men should not have long hair and women should not cut their hair. He says it is a shame for a man to have long hair and it is a shame for a woman to remove her covering or to shear or to shave her head. And I want to tell you that when Paul says long hair, he is not referring specifically to length of hair. Because some cultures, some nationalities, if they never put scissors to their hair as long as they live, their hair only grows to their shoulders. Other nationalities can have hair down to their ankles. It's genetics, it's DNA. He is not referring to the length of the hair. He is referring to whether or not the hair is cut or uncut. The Greek word is komeo, which means to let the hair grow, to have long hair. And at the end of this chapter, at the end of this, uh, or rather this subject, this topic, he ends it by saying, if any man seem to be contentious about this, we have no such custom, neither in the churches of God. And people have used this in saying that, well, Paul is saying, listen, if you've got a problem about women not cutting their hair, we don't have this custom. Don't be contentious about it. Don't make an issue out of it. That is utterly ridiculous to think that Paul would spend all of these verses explaining this spiritual concept 
and then dismiss himself at the end by saying, well, don't really worry about anything I just said. The custom that he was referring to was the custom in Greek culture. He was speaking to the Corinthian church. Corinth was a very well-known Greek city, very immoral city. And the custom that he was referring to that did not exist in the churches was the custom of Greek women cutting their hair and offering it as a sacrifice to Greek gods. And the women that were being converted to Jesus Christ would cut their hair and offer it as a sacrifice to Jesus Christ. This is why he spent this time explaining women do not cut your hair. The custom that exists in the culture does not exist in the church. Women do not cut your hair. Now, it is very clear that in Jewish culture, this has existed for thousands of years. Paul was not creating something new here. This has existed for quite some time. Even today in Jewish culture, I spoke to a lady. I was preaching this in a church, and a lady came up to me by the name of Sister Thompson after the service was over, and she said that recently she had gone to an Orthodox Jewish funeral. And at the funeral, there were some rabbis at the door, and they were handing out yarmulkes, which is that little hat, that little circular cap that they put on the head. They were handing out yarmulkes to the women, and she walked up and stuck out her hand to the rabbi to receive her yarmulke, and the, and the rabbi looked at her and looked at her hair, and he said, you do not need a yarmulke. You do not need a covering. Your hair is uncut. You are covered. This is in Jewish culture. Because she had uncut hair, they understand that she is covered. And the question is, for any student of the Bible, why does the Bible teach against women cutting their hair? What is it about the woman that she needs a covering when the man does not? Is it God just wanting to put regulations on the women and make it hard for them to live for God? Absolutely not. There is a spiritual parallel that God is revealing to us with the woman and her uncut hair. To understand this, we must understand that there is a difference between men and women. That may seem like a simple statement, but that message should be preached probably every day. There is a difference between men and women. We are not the same. You cannot choose your gender. It doesn't matter how you feel about yourself or if you have surgery. If you were born a man, you are going to die a man. If you were born a woman, you're going to die a woman. And if you had surgery, you're just going to die a deformed man or a deformed woman. Our souls are different. We were made different on purpose. The Bible teaches us that man was made in the image of God. When you look at the man, he is an earthly, physical manifestation of what God is in the heavens. But the woman was made differently. It does not say our heavenly mother who art in heaven. It says our heavenly father who art in heaven. Paul said, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Men do not need a covering. For as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. While the man was made in the image of God, the woman was made in the image of the church. Thank you, all three of you. Paul gives us the parallel in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. He said, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, even as unto the Lord. You have to get past that quick. Whew. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ. Everybody say Christ. 
is the head of the church. You have husband, Christ, wife, church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church, everybody say church, is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. Husbands, Christ. Wives, church. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, Christ. Wives, church. This is not just some simple thing that Paul is using to be cool here. There is a spiritual parallel between husbands and Christ and wives and the church. The woman was made from the man, specifically from the rib of the man. Man was made in the image of God. The only image of God there ever has been is Jesus Christ. And man had to pay a price in his body for the woman to live, just as Jesus paid a price in his body for the church to live. New natural souls are the result of the union between the man and the woman. New spiritual souls are the result of the union between Christ and the church. Something had to come out of the side of the man for the woman to live. And something had to come out of the side of Jesus Christ for the church to live. The church receives the name of Jesus during their union. The bride receives the name of the husband during their union. And let me insert here that the church cannot receive the titles of the groom, only the name of the groom. No matter how much I love my wife, it doesn't matter that we're married, she can never assume the title husband, father, or son. She cannot have my titles, but even though I cannot give her my titles, I can give her my name. And if she has my name, she has access to everything that I can offer her. And when you get baptized in water, you shouldn't get baptized in titles because you can never take on the titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but you can take on the titles, Jesus, or the name Jesus Christ. And when you have that name, you have everything that God has to offer through those titles. Woo! Now, one of my favorite scriptures, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. He said, I will make him and help meet or fitting for him. You look at the woman. Woman is taken from the man. Woman refers to opposite of man. When you have opposites, you have equal power. You have opposites in contrast in life. You have black and white, in and out, up and down. These are equalities on opposite end of the spectrum. And when God said, and help meet, everybody's saying, help meet. This comes from two Hebrew words, Ezer Konegdo. I'm sure I pronounced that perfectly which means help or strength that corresponds or is opposite to man. They are equal in power, man and woman. To be a true opposite, it's equal in power. But equal in power does not mean equal in authority. There's a big difference. Now, in the eyes of God in eternity, men and women are equal. We are all sons when we are born again. Whether you are male or female, Jesus sees you as a son. This is why he said, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, male or female. Galatians 4 and 5, to redeem them that are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. You are a son when you get born again. Galatians 4 and 7, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. The Bible says God dealeth with you as sons. John said, what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? He said again, beloved, now are we the sons of God. Ladies, you are sons of God. Now, you might have a problem with this. I apologize for that. 
So let me help you, all the men in the house, could you please lift your hand and say, I am a bride. Is that Bible? Your gender has nothing to do with you being a son, and your gender has nothing to do with you being a bride. That's why Jesus said through the Apostle Paul, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. When Jesus looks at us, it is in equality. Everybody has the same opportunity and the same status in the eyes of God. But on earth, there is a hierarchy of authority. This is why Paul taught in Corinthians 11. He shows us the the hierarchy that came from God in the order of creation. You have God, Christ, male, female. God, Christ, male, female. And because these are God-created offices that we fulfill on earth, We have to meet the requirements of that office. If you think this message is old-fashioned and irrelevant, what is the battle that is happening in our world right now? What What is the hottest topic that's happening in our world? It's gender. There is such an attack on gender right now, trying to make everybody the same. But God says there's God, Christ, male and female. In the beginning, he made them male and female. There are different roles to fulfill for each of those genders, and there are different responsibilities to fulfill in each of those genders. Now, because we have these offices, we have to meet those requirements. And the order is God, Christ, male, female. Christ was an earthly office Jesus fulfilled as the Son of Man. In his office, he had to submit to his head, which was God. In his submission, did Christ have any less power or authority than God? No. Jesus said, all power. Is given unto me. Submission was the channel through which power and authority flowed from the head to the next office. We've made submission a dirty word. Submission in our society means a lower place, it means uh, you're being restricted, you're being constrained. But the Bible teaches us that submission is the key to authority and power. Under Christ, there is man. Man is to be submitted to Christ. Is a man supposed to have any less power or authority than Jesus Christ? No. Jesus said, I give you power to tread upon scorpions and serpents. He said, I'm going to give you power. The works that I do, greater than these shall you do. I'm giving you the same power that is inside of me, the Holy Ghost that's inside of me, I'm going to give to you. And as long as you are submitted to your head, all of the power and authority that abides in that head comes down and is made available to you. And then it's the woman. Is the woman supposed to have any less power or authority than the man? No. Man, I feel like I'm treading in touchy, touchy places right now. I feel like I'm walking on thin ice. Absolutely not. As long as there is submission to the head. Everybody say submission is a beautiful word. God has taught us that through submission, what is available in our head is made available to us. Now, the role of man, I appreciate y'all going with me on this journey. We're about to get somewhere, okay? The role of man is simpler to define, I believe, in the scripture than the role of woman. Why does a woman need to be covered to honor her head? The head of the woman is the man. 
Why does she need to be covered to honor her head? Why must she be covered in the presence of a higher authority? Because everything we do as the church in submission to the word of God lines up with spiritual truth in the heavens. When you look at the tabernacle in the Old Testament, the entire tabernacle was a physical example of a spiritual process. God commanded Moses in Exodus 25 and 40. He said, and look, make sure, pay attention, that you make them after their pattern. Everybody say pattern. Which was showed thee in the mount. You cannot deviate from the pattern, Moses. It doesn't matter what your preferences are. You may not like blue curtains. You may like golden curtains. You have to make them blue. You may not like goat's hair. You, make, you may like lion's mane, but you have to use goat's hair. You, you may not like the dimensions of the ark. You may want to use different. You have to do it exactly as I have showed you. Why? Because it's not just God giving some random instruction. He's giving a physical template for a spiritual reality there's something that pre-existed the tabernacle in the heavens and God gave to Moses the pattern to bring what pre-existed in the heavens to earth and if the pattern is incorrect the glory that abides in the heavens is not made available to the earth a counterfeit spirit will come but if the pattern is correct, a connection is made from heaven to earth. And that's why you saw when that ark was finished, when that tabernacle was dedicated, that pillar of fire came down, that pillar of cloud came down because the pattern made the connection to the spiritual reality in the heavens. The covering on a woman is her long hair. There are some traditions out there that say women need to wear veils. But Paul said her hair is given her for a covering. In verse 15 of chapter 11, if the woman have long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair. Everybody say hair. Is given her for a covering. And in verse 10, he said, for this cause ought the woman to have power. Everybody say power. On her head because of the angels. Now, even though God fills all space, there must be a particular place, if we can say place, that his manifest presence resides. Isaiah saw it in a vision in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And above it, above what? Above this picture of the Lord in his glorious garment sitting on the throne. Above it stood the seraphims. Everybody say covering. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. There was, there were certain things these angels were doing. Number one, they were covering the glory. Everybody say covering the glory. Number two, they were covering themselves in the presence of the glory. Ezekiel saw a similar vision in Ezekiel chapter 1. He saw the glory of God coming into the earth and the, 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 the power of God coming into the earth. And he saw these creatures. He said, thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another and two covered their body. These creatures had four wings. With two, they were stretched upward. They were over that glory and they were also covering their body. The two roles that the angels who live in the presence of the Lord fulfill is they cover the glory and they cover themselves in the presence of the glory. And then, that being in the heavens, God on earth gave us a physical representation of that spiritual reality. He told Moses, and thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub or angel on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof, and the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high. This is the vision that Ezekiel saw. This is the vision that Isaiah saw of the reality in the heavens. They're going to stretch their wings out covering. Everybody say covering. Covering the seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. They're facing each other 
toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. So in other words, they're facing each other, their wings are out, and they're bowed under those wings. They're covering the mercy seat, and they're covering themselves in the presence of that glory. Satan was in the head position of covering the glory. Ezekiel said of him, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. When it says that Satan was the anointed cherub, that means he was the designated angel for this head position of covering the glory. That word to cover means to hedge, to fence about, to shut in, to block, to overshadow, to screen, to stop the approach. Everybody say stop the approach. To shut off, to cover, to restrain. Satan was anointed as the restraining force of protection for the glory of God in the heavens. But Satan got sick of his role. He got tired of his position being subordinate to his head. And the Bible says that he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. We are the same. There's no distinction between us. I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Satan attempted to change his role and move position in the hierarchy of authority that God had set up. What is a woman doing when she cuts or trims or sometimes with a curling iron burns off the ends of that hair? What is she redo doing when she is removing her covering? Whether she understands it or not, she is attempting to change her God-given role. And this is exactly what Satan did when he was cast down from heaven. I asked my wife, because I don't have long hair, obviously. I'm losing all of my hair, actually. They are committing suicide. Every time I take a shower, they're just diving into the drain. Please pray for them, okay? Okay. My wife, she's never cut her hair. And she has shown me her hair, the very ends of her hair. Sometimes because of the length of the hair, the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals that are in that follicle cannot reach all the way to the end. And the ends split. Split ends. And in the eyes of man, that can be ugly. I said, baby, have you ever been tempted to cut your hair? She's like, duh. Duh. Yes, because it can be unruly. You got all that hair. It can be hot on top of your head. There is a sacrifice involved in not cutting the hair. And she explained to me how there's women, you, you might not use scissors, but you can use a curling iron and burn that hair a little bit shorter. You can perm that hair a little bit shorter to reduce some of that, that frustration that's there. But when you reduce the length of your hair, Paul said, if you reduce the length of your hair at all, you might as well shave yourself bald. That's what he said. It's in the eyes of God. It's the exact same thing. Just a little nip, a cut, or a tear is the same in the eyes of God as if you just shaved yourself bald. Satan wanted to change his role, and he has put this inside of the woman. There is a special hatred Satan has for the woman, and here is why. Because you ladies with uncut hair, represent on earth what he used to be in the heavens. You are the earthly physical parallel for the reality that exists in the heavens. And Satan sees you and he hates your guts. This is why in Genesis 3.15, God said to Lucifer, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, hostility, hatred, animosity. There's going to be a clash 
between the woman and Satan that does not exist with the man. There is a battle, there is a supernatural struggle that happens between the woman and Satan that does not exist with men. Let's look at this parallel. Satan was the covering for the glory of God in the heavens. That glory was in the heavens, and then God put that glory in a box covered by angels. Then he put that glory in a man, the man Christ, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that there were angels ascending and descending upon him. Wherever you see glory, you see angels. They're connected to each other. Then that glory left the body of Jesus Christ. When he said it's finished, the veil of the temple was rent. That glory was made available to the church. And now the Bible says that the angels are ministering spirits sent to minister for those who are the heirs of salvation. There are angels that encamp around about them that fear him. There are literally angels in this room right now because we are the church and the glory of God is inside of us as the church. Which gender was made in the image of the church? The woman was made in the Im image of the church, and the woman's hair, glory of God as protection, and he covered himself in the presence of that glory as a sign of submission. This is why he hates the woman. He wants fallen angels, women who want to change their roles. Holy angels can relate to women who refuse to change their role. Ladies, you are the earthly equivalent of the angels of God. You are covering that glory. When Paul said, for this cause ought the woman to have power. Everybody say power. On her head because of the angels. That phrase because of can mean in, among, or a part of. They see you as their earthly counterpart. And when it says you have power on your head because of the angels, that word power is exousia. There's two kinds of power in the New Testament. There's dunamis. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Dunamis is the power to act, the power to perform. Exousia is authority, or restraining jurisdiction. Ladies, you have got the power to restrain Satan from touching the glory. God has given you the jurisdiction to hold back the darkness from touching the glory. Men do not have this. We don't have it. And I've heard some ladies, they don't really like this, and they say, well, we're on the bottom. you got God, Christ, male, female. Females are on the bottom. You're right. You're on the bottom. So is the foundation of this building. And if there's a problem in this foundation, the walls are going to show it, the roof is going to show it, the, found, the whole building is going to have issues. If there's a problem in this foundation, and God has made the woman the first line of defense against the unholiness and the wickedness of this world. Ladies, when you come to church and you refuse to cut your hair and you worship God, Satan is being held back from the people of God because of your submission mission to this commandment by the apostle paul it is in your hands to hold back the darkness listen i've been in churches where there was a bunch of good men but the women had let go of this holiness and you really couldn't accomplish much of anything there but i've also been in churches where the men were very low-key but the women maintained this standard in the bible and man, I'm telling you, there was apostolic revival. And I have tried for years to get men to behave the same way in church that women do. Because it seems like women can just, bam, they can hit that intercession. Pow. Holy Ghost starts moving. Wah! No hesitation. They're just there. Pow. And men are slower. 
And it's because it's God that has put this in us. Ladies, the reason why you're just there all of a sudden is because you live there. You are the first line. I want you to hear what I'm saying. Satan has tried to make you feel insignificant. Satan has tried to belittle your role in the kingdom of God. But God has given to you the power to hold back the darkness. Satan is terrified of a woman who refuses to let go. Satan is terrified of the female that says, I am staying in submission to God. Woo. Lift your hands. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Just let your voice out and thank the Lord for this revelation. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this authority, this exousia, this restraining force, God, against the darkness of this world. Do it again. Let something flow. Let there be a flow. Open your mouth and let's praise the Lord together. Angels work with ladies in ways they do not work with men. There's a lady in our church, Sister Danae Richardson. She's, she's a powerful woman of God. She actually teaches all over the country. She travels abroad. She's sang for the president. I mean, she's top notch. And she has never cut her hair. Now, let me tell you something. There may be a lady here that has cut their hair. And Satan will tell you, you messed up. It's too late. You cut your hair. He is a big, fat liar, liar, pants on fire. If you have cut your hair because you did not understand this, all you have to do is say, God, I'm sorry. I'll never do it again. And the angels that follow the ladies with uncut hair will come to you, and it will be as if you have never cut your hair. And the moment you repent, your hair is long in the eyes of God. And she's never cut her hair. She had just had uh, her daughter, Morgan. Morgan was about two years old. And she was combing her hair in her bedroom. And a voice came to her in a powerful and alarming way. Where is Morgan, her daughter? And Danae got up, very alarmed. She looked in the room. Morgan was playing behind her, and she was not there. She went all over the house, could not find Morgan. She went outside in the front yard. Morgan was not there. She went out in the backyard. Morgan was not there. There was a pool in the backyard, in-ground pool, about eight feet deep on the deep end. And Danae stepped to the edge of that pool, and she saw her daughter in the deep end of that pool, at the bottom of the pool. And her daughter was standing on her feet, and her hands were raised, And there was a funnel of air coming from the surface of that water to her daughter's mouth. The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him. This is the kind of protection that churches have where women do not cut their hair. There is an authority. There is a specific level of revival that cannot be achieved where women cut their hair. I was preaching in a church in a large city, great church, awesome church, holy church, and we had had I believe about 40 people get the Holy Ghost. Many, many people baptized. Many miracles happened. But I could feel that there was still some massive resistance to a breakthrough for the church. We were having people pray through, but there was not a general breakthrough for the church. It was just this heaviness. It just felt heavy the whole time. And I was very wore out. I was preaching my guts out. And 
towards the end of uh, that afternoon, uh, somebody relayed to me the information of what was happening in that area. I knew something very, very immoral was happening. You could feel this immoral opposition to revival. And they told me that there was a gay pride weekend that weekend in that city. They had painted the fire trucks rainbow colors. They had painted the walls of the buildings uh, down the street. They were going to do their parade in rainbow colors. They had spent tens of thousands of dollars doing this. And they were out there dancing in the street and <clears throat> just going at it. And so that afternoon I prayed. I said, God, I need some help. We desperately need a breakthrough in the spirit realm. And I said, Lord, I know you send angels with me, but I'm asking you to send Michael, the archangel, to come and help in this revival. Now, you have a choice. You can pray for little angels to come help you, or you can pray for the biggest, baddest angel the Bible talks about to come help you. It's your choice. According to your faith, so be it unto you, okay? If I had a little skinny whippersnapper over here and Arnold Schwarzenegger over here, and they say, who would you like to be your bodyguard? I would not pick the little whippersnapper. I would pick Arnold, okay? So I said, Lord, if you can send Michael, he doesn't have to stay. I know he's got a busy schedule. He does. He's going all over the place. The Bible says he is the prince that stands for the people of God. That's us. And he's not omnipresent. Jesus is omnipresent. Jesus is here, and he's also in China. Michael cannot be two places at once. So I say, God, if you could just clear five minutes out of his schedule. If you pray specific prayers, you'll get very specific answers. Clear five minutes of his schedule. All he has to do is come and just destroy the opposition and then go do his thing. So I kind of forgot about it, actually. I was preaching that night. And towards the end of the service, the, the back of the church was like this, very high, lifted up. And, and I was preaching, and man, at the end of that service, the Holy Ghost, it was like a Holy Ghost lightning bolt hit that place. And people came out of their pews. It was like Sunday night here. People came out of their pews. They began to run and dance and shout and speak in tongues, lay hands on each other. People were getting drunk in the spirit, and, and the Holy Ghost was flowing. I was just operating in the altar and the Holy Ghost, and, a, and an elderly lady came up to me. And she, I found out later, she is um, very, very gifted in the spirit in that church because you never know if people come up and say something. You don't know if they're crazy or if they're legitimate. And so I always ask the pastor when somebody comes up to me, I say, is that person crazy or are they legitimate? And they'll say, well, they're crazy. I dismiss what they say. If he says they're legitimate, then I'll listen to what they say. And I asked the pastor, and he said, she is a prophetess. She is a powerful woman of God. She, if she tells you what's going on, it's going on, I promise you. She came up to me in the altar call, and she said, Brother Campatella, she said, at the end of that service, when you lifted your hands, she said, a massive angel came through the ceiling and landed right behind you. And all he did was he stood there, and she said he folded his hands and just looked at everybody. And when he did that, fire shot out of that angel and destroyed spiritual resistance in that church. And she, I could tell... I could tell she felt a little bit awkward, and she said, now, Brother Campitella, I'm not trying to be crazy. I don't, I've never had this happen before. She said, but God told me the name of the angel. God said that this is Michael, the archangel, and he has come to fight for this church for apostolic revival and a destroying of the opposition that exists against this church. God sent that archangel. And I want to tell you something. Those type of things only happen in churches where women refuse to cut their hair because angels are not going to come in a rebellious environment. They will avoid you 
they will avoid you because you are attracting the wrong kind of angel. But in churches where women say, God, I'm going to keep my hair long. I'm not going to take away anything from this hair. The mighty angels of God will come to you and they will fight on your behalf. They will fight in your family. They'll fight in the church. And I want to tell you something. Angels have come to this particular revival. I know it. I have felt them. They have come to this particular revival. Bible to do warfare for this church. I prophesy to you in the name of Jesus Christ, this church will never be the same again. A door has been opened in the spirit. God has opened a door for you. You will never be the same again. And because of your hunger and because of your desire, you are stepping through the door, never to go back, never to go back. You are stepping into that dimension where the angels are operating with you. If you you believe it I want you to lift your hands and lift your voice uh, and let something come out of your mouth uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, we believe Jesus Christ Now, this is my last service here until I come back. I'm just going to tell you everything, okay? Had a dream last night. God definitely, most certainly, you can stay standing or sit down or run. I don't care what you do. God most certainly speaks to me in dreams. In this dream, I was fighting with a giant, and he was massive, and he had this big old beard, and I knew he was... German. Wrestling with it. My wife told me later in the day, she said I had a very similar dream. Just fighting in my dreams. Fighting. Warfare. There is an intense warfare happening right now in this church. I've been dealing with it from before I came here and ever since I've been here. Fighting in the spirit. Not not fighting to survive, fighting to kick the devil's teeth in. A big difference. And I want to tell you ladies something. Now the men, we are the image of Jesus Christ. We lead by example. And we're about to step into a dimension of prayer and lead by example. But ladies, I want you to do exactly what you feel to do in the next few moments. I don't even know what time it is. I might have gone over. I'm not sure. What time is it? 821. So we've got a couple of minutes. But you ladies, there is going to be an unction. There is going to be a spiritual energy. Some of you are feeling it already right now. There's going to be a spiritual power that comes upon you because of this revelation that God has given to you of your role in the kingdom. And I want you to lift your hands, and I want you to lift your voice, and I want you to get out of your seats, and I want you to begin to pray with aggression and power. I want you to pray against every spirit that will come against this church, every spirit that will come against your family. I want you to pray protection over this church. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do what you feel. Some of you are going to feel like something is in your hand. You're going to feel this aggression in your voice, in your mouth. I want you to pray. You young ladies, you have got what I'm talking about. You have got angels working with you right now. Do your thing. In the name of Jesus, uh, men, why don't you get out of your pew? Anybody want to pray for a few minutes? Uh, step out of your pew. Begin to operate in the spirit. Uh, in the name of Jesus, young men, uh, get out of your pews. Let's get in the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's it. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. We're never going back in the name of Jesus. We're never going back. Satan, you are defeated. Hey, we've got revival. We've got the victory. We've got liberty in the name of Jesus.
That's it. Lift your voice. Let your voice out. Let your voice out. Let your voice out until you feel that flow. Until you feel that flow. That uninhibited, unhindered flow. The angels of the Lord are here. Hey, in the name of Jesus, we have dominion. In the name of Jesus, we've got the power. I feel the same thing. And this is what I feel in the Holy Ghost. Listen to me for a moment. Hold on. I just saw Brother Soto. I believe you were telling them to take down their hair. I've never done this in my life. I've never felt to do it in my life. But you ladies, I want you to take down your hair, and I want you to hold it up as a, as a sign to God to remember his covenant to remember the power that he has given to you. I want you to hold up that hair, and I want you to begin to pray. Husbands, if you are near your wife, I want you to lay hands upon her and release her in her God-given role. Release her in her God-given authority. Dads, if you're near your daughters, if you're around your daughters, get your hands on them and release them in that authority and power. Come on, don't be afraid. I release the power, the anointing that God has put upon you. Satan is backing up right now. Satan is backing up right now. Hey! This is our covenant. This is what you told us to do, and we're doing it. Send the angels. Send the angels. Send the angels. Dispatch the angels, Lord. Mama, begin to dispatch some angels in your family. Mama, begin to command some angels uh, into your children, uh, around your home. Mama, begin to loose some angels uh, at your job. Young ladies, begin to loose some angels uh, in this city, uh, in your neighborhoods. Uh, hey! In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's anointing. That's power. That's power. That's power. That's power. It's all over you. Ah, they're going right now. Some of you are stepping into intercession. The angels are working with you right now. They're working with you right now. They're going right now. Come on. Don't resist that intercessory prayer. I know it's Wednesday night, but there's a Holy Ghost anointing upon us. Come on. Push that wall. If you feel something hindering you, it's not you. If you feel something resisting you it's not you you gotta push that spirit back you gotta push it back you got the power you've got the power Satan, you are not allowed in this church. Satan, you are not allowed in this city. Satan, you are not allowed. You are not welcome. You are not permitted. Somebody start praying against the spirit of alcoholism. Somebody tear that spirit down. Somebody pray against the spirit of drug addiction. Come on, pull that spirit down. You're not going to sit on that throne any longer. You're coming down. You're coming down. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the 
Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.